Hello, welcome to the uh, third seg segment of the ninth lecture uh, in which I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the difference between legal and moral accountability. Legal responsibility often involves judgments of causation and this is perhaps where we get a lot of our moral notions about causation being involved in uh, moral accountability. In the criminal law we're um, very interested in whose decision and whose action caused the harm. We not only we look for a guilty mind to determine who's to be, who to punish, and we also looked for the what's called the actus reus, the uh, who, who's the cause of the harm in deciding who we should punish. This is retributive justice in the criminal law, and our philosophical notions of retributive justice uh, follow the same model. In the tort law, we ask questions like who caused the damage. We have to determine which of the parties um, you know, who could be sued is the one who actually caused the damage. And we also worry about who had the duty of care, which is equivalent to worrying about who had the guilty mind, who, who violated their duty of care. And then we determine who should pay. And this, again, corresponds to the moral notion of compensatory justice. But legal and moral responsibility come apart in certain cases. Uh, there's a couple of examples here. Um, vicarious liability in tort law. The employer is liable for the wrongs committed by an employee while on the job. Even though the, um, the, the, the um, employer didn't have any role in, uh, in getting that uh, employee to act, um, to act dishonestly or whatever. In this case we probably would say yes, whatever, the, the, according to law the uh, employer is legally responsible, um, legally liable, but we wouldn't usually say that the um, employer is morally accountable for the dishonest acts of the employee without further examination. I mean, may, you know, maybe the employer did play some role here, but we, uh, we don't know that. And, uh, but the, it wouldn't matter uh, in, under, um, uh, under tort law. Another case in tort law is the problem of, is the question of deep pockets. Supposing several agents jointly cause the harm, uh, but some of them are poor and one of them is very rich, well in, in li all likelihood the, um, the rich one is going to end up paying all the damages. Even though the rich one is maybe no more morally responsible than uh, the others, the rich, the rich uh, agent is going to be the one who's held legally liable. Again, the legal and moral, legal uh, liability and moral accountability seem to come apart here. Um, it's also the case that the, um, w in tort law, when uh, once compensation is paid, uh, which is the main thing, the um, search for legal responsibility stops. We don't go into the, the supposing a company is held uh, liable for certain damages. We don't go into the company and see who actually see what individuals made the decisions that resulted in this. Um, so again, but in the case of moral accountability, we might not want to stop at, uh, at saying that the company was, uh, was morally accountable. We want to maybe want to know whose decisions. And as I showed in the uh, earlier segment, picking out which individuals within a company are, um, are, are, are causally responsible for outcomes can be very, very tricky. But there is a big difference uh, between moral accountability and causal responsibility. Because causal responsibility, as I said earlier, is a scientific judgment and moral accountability is an ethical judgment and the moral accountability does not follow directly from causal responsibility because of the is ought gap. You can't directly derive a statement of what you ought to do from statements about how the world is. You can recall that from, from earlier lectures. Judgments of moral accountability involve, sometimes they involve judgments of causation, but they always involve ethical approaches, ethical theories. You bring ethical theories in to justify um, your, um, what, what's going on. What, your, the, the ethical theory that's taken from the ethical theory enables you to uh, cross the is ought gap. For example, um, when you punish somebody and you punish them justly, well, you look for, you, you apply a theory of retributive justice, and you look for the cause, you find the person is the cause, the person's uh, guilty mind um, led to the, the, uh, the uh, outcome, and you apply retributive justice. So let's go on with our sort of pluralist ethical approach to these 
retrospective judgments of moral accountability. Um, as I said, in, if you're thinking in terms of retributive justice, then you are looking, going to look for a cause, you're going to want to know about causal responsibility, and you're going to want to know about uh, the guilty mind, the, the guilty intent. And similarly in comp compensatory justice, again, you're probably going to look for who caused and who's the cause here, and whether that person's um, behavior was faulty in some way, whether they, um, uh, you know, whether they violated certain duties uh, of care or did something that failed to foresee something that a reasonable person could foresee. Okay, so these these two uh, notions of um, uh, of uh, these two ethical theories do require cause here, right, and and here. But other theories don't always do that. For example, in a consequentialist theory, you might hold somebody accountable in order to prevent further harm. You might the, the consequentialist might not be worried in in ascribing retrospectively acquiring a moral accountability. They might want to make an example of somebody in order to uh, prevent further harm, and maybe that leads to the greatest uh, total aggregate welfare. Whether it's fair or not, whether it violates somebody's rights or not, well, those are different decisions, right? But the consequentialist approach is going to say, look, hold people accountable in, in ways that will maximize uh, aggregate total happiness. And that's, it, it, they're not looking for the cause. And as I say, maybe you're going to object. You're going to say, well, it's not fair to hold somebody accountable for something they didn't do. But, um, but consequentialists, as we know, are not necessarily thinking in terms of fairness. Uh, Principle-based accounts are very, very concerned with motivations. They're going to look at what um, motivation, what motivated the agent. So even if we can't maybe ascribe um, causal responsibility to Amy, we can examine her motivations. Is she being greedy? Is she being, um, or is she being, you know, fair and considerate? Um, is she trying to respect people's rights, et cetera, et cetera? Is she keeping, you know, is she fulfilling contracts? Um, what are her motivations? And she can be held accountable for her motivations, even in the absence of knowing what, uh, um, what, what um, are the causal effects of, uh, of her decision. Similarly, in virtue ethics, we can hold people accountable for their character traits. And um, what, um, even if they, um, again, in the absence of, uh, of a determination of causal responsibility, we can still say what that person did exhibited uh, a bad character. They were dishonest or greedy or selfish or sleazy or whatever, right? And in the care ethics, we can look and see whether the person was you know, showing the proper um, uh, dispositions to care. Were they, um, um, were they showing empathy? Were they showing compassion? And <clears throat> were they paying attention to, uh, to the relationships that they were in and the preservation of them? All right, so the moral of this is that causal responsibility, determination of causal responsibility is not all there is to determinations of moral accountability. Sometimes it's required, as in these two cases here, in retributive justice and compensatory justice, both require cause, okay? But the others, uh, we may not have to have uh, this causation totally figured out. We can show this perhaps in this um, flowchart, uh, which uh, you're going to see again in the next chapter, but we can have a preliminary look now. An agent makes a decision, okay? Now, this, you can ask the question, is the agent, agent's uh, decision compromised? Is, is there agency compromised uh, by certain excusing conditions? And okay, so we're not gonna, that, that's for next chapter. So don't, don't worry about this for a moment. Let's say that the person is an agent and they're not, there's no, they have no excuses. You can ask then, are they causally responsible? And uh, if so, then you can apply con retributive or compensatory justice reasoning to uh, what they did. But even if you can't determine their causal responsibility, you can't show that they're a necessary or sufficient or nest condition for the outcome, you can still look at their motivation, okay? And if their motivation can, they can be held ac accountable for their moral, for their motivation in theories of rights and theories of justice and so on. You can also look at their character. Are they display, what sort of bad character are they displaying? And again, you can uh, hold them morally accountable for their character or for their, um, the, the, their concern for and responsibility, taking responsibility for relationships. Okay, so only then, after you've looked at the causal responsibility, the motivation, the character, um, do you get to a final judgment that perhaps they're not morally accountable for the decision. 
All right, let's go back a little bit again. We're looking at retrospective um, role of causal responsibility. Um, which of the following shows <coughs> the causal responsibility being used in a retrospective way to make a judgment of, uh, of, of accountability, perhaps? Okay, pause the video for a moment and we'll look through these, uh, the, these answers. Okay, let's have a look here. The managers of a socially responsible corporation must take into account the interests of their employees as well as those of their owners in making their decisions. This is thinking prospectively and it certainly makes sense to look at causal responsibility here. Okay, so that's prospective, not retrospective. <clears throat> the managers of the corporation with good character must take into account the effects of their decision on future generations. Again, they're thinking predictively. They're not thinking retrospectively here. All right, so they're thinking, what, um, what are the effects going to be? We're, not, we're looking, as I said, for the retrospective role. The managers did a careful cost-benefit analysis before making their decision. Again, they're thinking predictively. They're trying to predict what the effects will be, and that's very uh, perfectly um, um, valid use of causal responsibility. But it's not necessarily a retrospective judgment. It's a predictive judgment. The judge carefully considered the effects of the management committee decision before handling, handing down her judgment. Here, it's implied that the management committee decision took place in the past. The judge is looking at the effects of that decision, so it is something about causal responsibility in the past, and that would be our best uh, answer here. Okay? So uh, join me again in a few minutes for uh, the next segment.